Okay, thank you very much, Barry. I see that I am I'm I'm switched on, so to speak. Um, and I join Barry in welcoming all of the participants uh, today, both those of you who are here present and those who are joining us remotely uh, for this IE event on the theme of the EU strategic compass one year on. Our guest speaker is General Robert Brieger, chair of the EU military committee and formerly chief of staff of the Austrian Armed Forces. And the general has very generously taken time out of an extraordinarily busy schedule to address us. We're also delighted that our very own chief of staff, Lieutenant General Sean Clancy, has joined us uh, to deliver some opening remarks. Following uh, the Lieutenant's remarks, General Brieger will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we will proceed to a Q&A &A &A with our audience. For those of you present in the room, you will be able to ask a question by raising your hand and a microphone will be brought uh, to you. And I might ask you to uh, those uh, posing a question, if you would identify yourselves and, and your affiliation. For those attending virtually, you'll be able to join the discussion by using the Q&A function on the Zoom, on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once General Brieger has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Uh, and please, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Might I also ask members of the audience present if they wouldn't mind putting their phones on silent um, so as not to distract the speakers or the chair for that matter. I'm now pleased to welcome Lieutenant General Clancy and hand over to him for his opening remarks. Thank you, um, Barry. General Brieger, ladies and gentlemen, and our audience that are joining us virtually, uh, what a wonderful uh, opportunity and occasion and pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon to just say a couple of remarks uh, on behalf of the Irish Defence Forces, the Department of Defence, uh, to welcome uh, our guest today who is going to speak to us all. Um, it is with great gratitude that we 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 speak of General Brieger, who is, as Barry has said, the chairman of the EU Military Committee. And that involves, uh, the, I suppose, the highest level of strategic engagement from a military officer point of view at the political military strategic level in Brussels and in, over the EU. He is, of course, the military advisor to the high rep and vice president of the EU Commission. Uh, and he is the representative, of course, on the PSC. And in that vein, he is the spokesman and the spokesperson for all of the EU CHODs, which is a, an onerous task, uh, which weighs very lightly on it, I think, on him because of the experience he has had. And I know Barry will introduce his wider experience in due course. But the role really is fundamentally about being able to influence, shape, and convince, I guess, the military political sphere of the need and the need for preparedness and the conditions and the understanding that can be achieved through compromise in order to gain the unity of effort that's required at an EU level. And we saw that more in great starkness when the strategic shock, if you will, that hit Europe at the beginning of last year, when for the first time since 1945, Europe and this, on the territory of Europe, we have seen a major and war. And in one sense, the theme of today's discussion and talk from the general around the strategic compass, it was rather fortuitous, if I can, in terms of the preparedness of the EU, of having that instrument agreed through influence, through convincing, and that we had that instrument to guide us and to prepare us for the very unified and deliberate effort 
that came to bear from Europe in the support of Ukraine that still exists, of course. And we are all too conscious of the horrors that war bring. And it is through this lens that I'm sure that the general will bring, as chair of the EU military committee, bring some of his reflections and perspectives that he has from that very, very high uh, position that he holds on all our behalfs. Thank you very much. And my thanks to you, Lieutenant General, for your thought-provoking observations, which have admirably set the scene for our discussion. The strategic compass has been hailed as representing the first time the EU member states have adopted a strategic document with a common vision and detailed objectives on EU security and defence. It was two and a half years, I think, in the making and was finalized amid the dramatic deterioration of the European security environment consequent on Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Adoption of the compass is, of course, a step, albeit a very important one, uh, on the journey. Time and the implementation process will tell how well its prescriptions meet the security needs of the EU over the rest of the decade, which is the horizon time horizon for the compass. So it's very timely that we have the opportunity to get a most authoritative perspective and insight on both the development and progress on the implementation of the compass as it passes the first anniversary of its adoption. General Robert Brieger is chairperson of the EU European Union Military Committee, which as Lieutenant General has said, is comprised of the chiefs of defense of the EU member states and is the highest level military body within the council. It's a highly responsible role. Committee gives military advice and makes recommendations to the council through the political and security committee and directs all military activities within the EU framework, in particular, the planning and execution of military common security and defense policy missions. General Brieger has had a highly distinguished career including service as commander of the Austrian contingent of K4 from 2001-2002 and force commander of Operation Althea in Bosnia-Herzegovina in 2011-12. He was appointed chief of staff of the Austrian Armed Forces in 2018 prior to assuming his present highly responsible role. And it is my pleasure to hand over to him now for his presentation. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the kind invitation and also uh, many thanks for the interesting discussion during our lunch. I understand that uh, this has become a welcome tradition for the chairman of the EU Military Committee when uh, visiting the Emerald Isle. On the other hand, uh, just because something is traditional, it's no reason to do it, of course. As Gustav Mahler, the famous Austrian composer, used to say, Tradition shall not be the worship of ashes, but the preservation of the fire. This evokes to the fire that is currently burning at the heart of Europe. A new impetus in response to the increasingly worrying scenario surrounding us. A fire we need to preserve, in fact, in our quest for European common defense to be urgently forged, if not now, when? Therefore, I do really welcome this uh, invitation for at least three reasons. First, because the threatening security scenario surrounding Europe demands a strong commitment by all stakeholders across security. Second, because these debates frequently provide the opportunity to comprehend perceptions from non-traditional perspectives. I found myself frequently confronted with unconventional ideas or perspective when eventually led, which eventually led to some very pertinent reflections. I'm sure it will be the case also today. Lastly, for the chance I can get to become acquainted with this passionate think tank so focused on European international affairs. 
Promoting these public debates about the need to develop a common EU defense is crucial for gaining support from the same people who will ultimately benefit from its European citizens. Because even among our fellow citizens, there is still some resistance to linking the image of Europe and its member states when acting under the EU flag with defense and security. A trend that must be absolutely reversed. I will focus my intervention today on how, why we shall continue to feed the fire supporting in implementation of our pillar document, the strategic compass. One of the most fundamental concepts mentioned in the document is strategic autonomy or as lately redefined strategic responsibility. This term simply means that the European Union aims to achieve the ability to act alone when traditional or new partnership is unavailable. The alternative would be long-term dependence on other security providers, which would result in irrelevance for the European Union. However, working in partnership is and will continue to be our preferred way for managing crisis. As a famous Irish proverb recalls, forgive my accent, heirs call a kailar a varen na dina. Uh, <laughs> Under the shelter of each other, people survive. But while we make sure we cannot look after each other, we shall invest in becoming stronger ourselves. My ultimate goal today is to demonstrate that being united and sharing the values of peace and security is essential for everyone. And everyone has to contribute. So let's start with the strategic compass. As you are aware, member states endorsed this policy document in March last year, a month after return uh, from the war uh, of the war in Europe. Some even believe that the strategic compass was the European Union's response uh, to Russian aggression of Ukraine. Instead, the debate regarding a stronger, more independent EU in terms of crisis management had begun two years earlier. The terrible chain of crisis encircling our continent from Africa to the Caucasus and the Western Balkans, as well as the combination of threats from the maritime domain to terrorism to the undefined cyberspace demanded an immediate and more proactive response. Obviously, from a strategic communication perspective, the signing and implementation of the strategic compass just prior to the invasion of Ukraine was evidence of European foresight. Indeed, we took immediate action. Europe's response to Russia's attack to Ukraine has been as strong and anonymous as unexpected in Moscow. Instead of tearing us apart, this tectonic cataclysm strengthened our bonds, disrupting some untouchable paradigmas, such as delivering lethal weapons to a partner country and training its soldiers to make optimal use of those weapons. Or more, during the Foreign Affairs Council last week, member states decided to deliver 1 million rounds of artillery ammunition to Ukraine within the next year. A genuinely unprecedented action, let me say. And this is the undeniable demonstration that European Union security and defense efforts have grown exponentially with even more potential. Numerous partners, in fact, particularly in the global south, saw what we did for Ukraine and now expect us to respond to their requests with the same promptness and efficiency. By implementing these documents, we are therefore advancing towards common strategic culture, thereby strengthening our unity and solidarity and credibility, also in the eyes of our competitors. In particular, we by learning and employing the language of power. The conflict in Ukraine has therefore strategically accelerated an already ongoing development. 
some pra pragmatic examples. Allow me to get through some of the most significant accomplishments in the four chapters of the strategic compass, beginning with ACT. As I've previously stated, the compass exhorted us to be more assertive. We have therefore increased the effectiveness of our civilian military crisis management tools, demonstrating speed, resolve, and adaptability. Like by launching the Ukraine military assistance mission in record time, 30,000 Ukrainian personnel will be trained by the end of 2023. Despite the fact that the eastern flank is a priority, now we have not neglected the other fronts. From the South Caucasus to the Sahel, enhancing existing missions and establishing new ones. Last in chronological order, the partnership mission to aid Niger is in its struggle against terrorist groups. Importantly, we are maximizing the use of the European Peace Facility for many of these activities, a genuine game changer for our contribution to European and international security. Like the 3.6 billion euro for lethal and non-lethal weapons for the Ukraine, or the 2 billion euro for the delivery of lethal weapons for African partners. That said, the European Union rapid deployment capacity continues to be the ACT chapter's central focus. 5,000 soldiers along with all necessary enablers to demonstrate our ability to respond swiftly and decisively to crisis outside the European Union. To make this a reality uh, by 2025, we must, of course, ensure that the new C2 structures and communication uh, capacities are fit for purpose. The first reality check for the RDC is scheduled to occur in Spain in October with the first live exercise. The most visible event for the European Union security and defense in 2023. Secure is the title of the second chapter of the strategic compass, referring to our capacity to predict threats, secure access to strategic domains and defend our citizens. State and non-state actors have increased their hybrid tactics by weaponizing food, migration, and energy. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has exac exacerbated this trend. In response, we have moved decisively beyond the conventional joint paradigma, land, sea, air, to multi-domain challenges such as cyber, space, and perceptions, and associated strategies. The third chapter in West addresses our need to spend more, but also spend better by spending together. The current fragmentation of the EU defense panorama is unacceptable. While in the US, they have only one type of tank, in Europe, we have about 15. Member states have indeed increased defense spending to unprecedented levels. 214 billion euros in 2021, a 6% 6% increase over 2020, expected to raise to additional 70 billion euros by 2025. The war in Ukraine has accelerated this trend. Unfortunately, less than 20% of all investments are made in collaboration. 18% in 2021, still far short from the agreed benchmark of 35%. As European Union, we have done our job providing resources and tools to intensify joint development and procurement while strengthening our technological sovereignty and reducing strategic dependencies. I'm thinking about the European Defense Fund, BESCO and EDA collaboration initiatives. We are even considering tax breaks, possibly. Now it's up to the member states. Otherwise, we risk going from the previous uncoordinated saving to a new uncoordinated spending with a further fragmentation of the European Union defense industry. Outside the European Union partners, and I'm now uh, relaying to the partner chapter, 
remain an essential source of strength and resilience, which is why we continue to invest in networks whenever it's of advantage. The Strategic Compass dedicates its specific chapter to partnerships, stating clearly how we must grow together as EU with other partners. Our missions and operations on the ground already co collaborate with United Nations missions in the Central African Republic, Mali, Somalia, or Yemen. Our partnership with the OSCE, African Union, and ASEAN are stronger. We invest continuously with the United States, with Canada and Norway on, variety, on a variety of security and defense issues. We have increased our informal ties with the United Kingdom and our commitment to our Eastern partners has been increased also through the EPF or other instruments like in Georgia or Moldova. We have increased our support in the Western Balkans, including the outlined but the continued deployment of UFO Althea in Bosnia and Herzegovina, OILEX in Kosovo, and EPF assistance throughout the whole region. We are expanding networks of military advisors as well as counterterrorism specialists in the respective EU delegations. In conclusion, even so, the European Union must become more strategically autonomous and responsible our partnership will remain essential. As you may know, this, is, this was the focus of the first Schumann Security and Defense Partnership Forum in Brussels last week. A solid discussion with concrete proposals starting from the pragmatic list advanced by the High Representative Josep Borrell. First, enhance the effectiveness of our civilian and military missions and operations in support of partners. Second, broaden the idea of security with more emphasis on prevention. Third, maximize the potential of, European, of the European peace facility. Fourth, be ready to help our partners build their own resilience. Fifth, train and exercise with our partners starting this year in the maritime domain. Sixth, let our defense initiatives pave the way for enhanced cooperation. So let me conclude. The world in which we live is undergoing rapid transformation and our security environment has worsened even further. Remember, we have only borrowed this world from the future generations. They deserve to have it returned in good, if not excellent condition. We must therefore make real or comp uh, commitment across the security domain as outlined in the strategic compass. On the other hand, as people say here, we will never plow a field by turning it over in our mind. We have already accomplished much. There is still much work to be done. Member states will continue to be in charge of this endeavor. We must continue to mobilize our political will as well as all resources and tools at our disposal, individually and in concert with our partners. I recognize that we will need to shatter more paradigmas, surmount biases and be courageous. On the other hand, the time is now or never. As simple as that. May the road rise up to meet you. So I appreciate your time and look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you.